Good afternoon. I am the head griot for America's Black Holocaust Museum. It's a museum dedicated to telling those untold stories of the injustices suffered by black people since their arrival in America in 1619. One of the questions I get all the time is, what is a griot? Griot is a term used in the French-speaking part of West Africa to describe those oral historians, the people who are the keepers of the history. It's their job to let the people of that community know who they are by sharing with them the stories of where they come from. On my left, you see a picture of my friend and mentor, Dr. James Cameron, the founder of America's Black Holocaust Museum, giving a tour to a group of young people in the museum. You also see to my right a photograph of me inside the museum in the early 2000s, giving a tour to a group of young people as well. We are storytellers. Griots tell stories in a variety of ways about a variety of topics. Some of those topics are very happy stories to tell. These are the stories of the triumphs of our people. But we are also required to be honest by also telling some of those ugly, those disappointing stories of the tragedies that they've suffered as well. It's always important to understand that the stories of the triumphs and the tragedies combined together give you a deeper understanding of the legacy of a people. So what I'd like to do today is to share with you a story. And this is a story of what I've learned from a lynching survivor about anger. On the photograph behind me, you see Dr. James Cameron, a lynching survivor, inside of America's Black Holocaust in the early 1990s, right around the time that I first met Mr. Cameron. You'll see photographs behind him that are photos of lynchings of blacks that occurred around the United States of America. You'll see in his left hand that he's holding a book. That's a book that he wrote as a teenager. It's his memoirs, A Time of Terror, a survivor story. He recounts in that book the lynching that he survived as a 16-year-old in Marion, Indiana. In his right hand, you see him holding a photograph. That photograph is the most famous lynching photograph in American history. Many people have seen it, but very few people know that there were supposed to be three men hanging from that tree. Very few people know that James Cameron survived that lynching on August 7th. 1930. When we had visitors come to the museum and they would go to our lynching exhibit and they would look at this photograph, I began to notice right away that there was a difference between the way young people and adults looked at this picture. Adults typically looked at the picture for a very brief period of time. They diverted their eyes downward and they usually walked off to another part of the museum. Children were different. They would look at this photograph in great detail, analyzing every aspect of it, asking very probing questions about it, and pointing out things that adults would never notice in the photograph. And they would point these things out to the grills at the museum. For instance, they would note that there were two women who were pregnant in this photograph. They would also notice that there's a woman in the center of the photograph who's wearing a fur coat. August 7, 1930, the temperature in Marion was 99 degrees, the hottest day of the year. And invariably, they would always notice the man in the center of the photograph who's pointing, and they would say that he looks like Adolf Hitler. Behind this crowd, you see 18-year-old Abram Smith and 19-year-old Thomas Shipp. These two young men were murdered by a mob of 10 to 15,000 angry white men, women, and children. And as I began to look at this photograph, I began to ask not what's there, but what's missing from the photograph. The incident that precipitated this lynching, the murder of a 23-year-old white man by the name of Claude Dieter by Abe and Tommy, was an incident that had a component of anger attached to it. The lynching itself, obviously, had a component of anger attached to it as well. But what I began to notice by looking in the faces of the people, you don't see any anger. In fact, you see the opposite. You see people who are smiling, people who are happy, 
people who've enjoyed themselves that day. Minus the bodies of these two young men behind them, you'll be hard pressed to know that they had just murdered these two young men and attempted to murder a third. So I began to ask about that anger. Where did it go? What happened to the anger that was so present just a few hours before this photograph was taken? And I came up with this idea that it was expended. The anger was used up. It had dissipated. They had gotten it out of their system. They were no longer angry. They were now elated. They were happy. They were overjoyed. They were celebrating. But there was someone there who could not celebrate. There was another person there on that day who obviously was still very angry, James Cameron. He was nearly killed by the same mob that killed his two friends. So he had anger inside of him. And this anger stayed with him for an extended period of time. But it got to a point where he realized that this anger was consuming every fiber of his mind and his body and his soul, and it was killing him on the inside. And he realized that he had to find a way to get rid of this hatred and this anger. And he used what I call righteous anger, a positively directed anger to get rid of that. He went through a process to get to this place that I call righteous anger. It was a process that was in some ways very difficult, but in other ways very joyful for him. He went from that place, being the victim of a lynching by the Ku Klux Klan in Marion, Indiana, to being a person who fought against the Ku Klux Klan by marching in Beloit, Wisconsin years later. So how did he get from that place to this place? It's a very interesting journey that Mr. Cameron went on. There were three aspects of this journey that helped him to get to this place that I call righteous anger. The first step in the journey was his unwavering faith in God. He believed that God saved his life on that day. He would always say that God sent an angel down to that crowd and it spoke to that crowd and said, leave this young man alone. He had nothing to do with these crimes. And miraculously, they let him go. People would always challenge Mr. Cameron and say that, well, we didn't hear a voice. That's not what happened. God didn't save you. And he would always answer in the same way. He said, for those of us who believe in God, no explanation is necessary. For those of us who don't believe in God, no explanation is possible. The second aspect of his transformation to get to righteous anger were beautiful flowers. One day, while waiting in his jail cell, waiting as an accessory before the act of murder, he looked out of a window and he saw these flowers. And they were beautiful flowers. He had seen them before. But on that particular day, those flowers did something for him that they had never done before. They raised his sense of self-esteem and actually made him feel joy for the first time since he had been locked up and for the first time since he was nearly killed by that mob. Something about those flowers on that particular day brought a smile to his face and made him feel good on the inside for the first time in a very long time. And the third aspect of this journey for Mr. Cameron was tricycles. Yes, tricycles. Let me explain. While he was awaiting trial, he was in a jail and he was befriended by the sheriff who protected him, who treated him like a son, who protected him from another possible lynching that was planned. Sheriff Bradley became his friend and began to treat this young man, James Cameron, like a son. They developed a bond, and it eventually became a bond that turned into love. Sheriff Bradley would allow young Cameron to leave the jail to run errands for him, and eventually he developed a relationship with Sheriff Bradley's family. He began to assist Sheriff Bradley and his wife raising their three beautiful children. He would go to their home, and he would be allowed to play with them. He taught them to ride their tricycles. He would put them on, their, on his back, 
and give them horsey back rides. He developed a love for Bradley's family. He developed a love for the sheriff and his wife and these three children, and he began to recognize that all that hatred and anger he had towards white people because no other white people had treated him well before this family did after the lynching, he realized that this hatred that was directed towards all whites was misplaced. How could I possibly hate all white people when these children, these beautiful children, have been so good to me? When this man and his wife have allowed me to play with their children and to join their family, how could I possibly have that same level of hatred? And he began to realize that it was misplaced and he had to replace it. So he replaced it with righteous anger, a positively directed anger. We've all heard this saying before, right? I remember hearing it as a child, sticks and stones. And as a young child, I believed it wholeheartedly. I believed it. But at some point in my life, I began to think of this saying in a different way. I began to look at it and I began to say, it's not true. In fact, it's a lie. Let me explain to you why I believe it's a lie. When we suffer a physical injury of any kind, there's a mechanism within our body that goes to work immediately beginning to heal that hurt and making us feel better immediately. We don't have to do anything to make it happen. It just happens. But when we suffer emotional pain, there's no such mechanism there for us. That pain can last for days, weeks, months, years, decades. So I want to tell you a story of what challenged me to get to this place of righteous anger. I worked as an electrician years ago at a company, and the company was doing poorly financially. Morale was very low. The president of the company invited our department to come in and meet with him so that he could tell us about his ideas for raising morale. We came into the meeting. He discussed these four or five different ways that he thought would be very good for raising morale. He asked us for honest feedback. I raised my hand after he was done, and I simply said, I don't think those things are going to work. He became beet red, very angry, and he looked at me and he said, well, that's how it's going to be, boy. I was absolutely shocked. The room became completely silent, and I paused for a moment, and I said, what did you say? And he repeated it again, even more angrily. Well, that's how it's going to be, boy. And my immediate reaction was to rise up out of my seat with intentions on inflicting physical pain on this man that would match the emotional pain that I was feeling at that particular moment. Fortunately, there was a coworker between the two of us that stopped me from putting hands on this man. I was very angry. I was very frustrated because I had no way of getting rid of this anger. So I left work early. I went directly to my wife's job with the intentions on telling my wife exactly what happened, getting this burden off my chest. And when I got there and she came to the car, I intended to tell her exactly what happened. But when she got in the car and I tried to tell her what happened, I couldn't say a word. I couldn't speak. I was so overcome with emotion that I could not do anything other than begin to cry. And I cried like I'd never cried before in my entire life. And those emotions stayed with me for weeks afterwards. I didn't know what to do with them. I asked people for advice, and all of these people gave me great advice, but none of that advice worked. None of it. And I began to recognize something, that anger is a normal part of our lives. We've all been angry before. And I recognized that my work at the museum as a griot was to talk about things that should make me angry all the time, but somehow it didn't. And that's when I began to realize I'm at that place of righteous anger. So what I began to do is to utilize the stories that I would tell of my ancestors to take me to this place of righteous anger. Righteous anger allowed me to use this tool as a griot to get to a place where I would use these negative emotions in a positive way. But never forget, though, that I still get angry. I get angry when I think of Emmett Till. 
when I see the pictures of Trayvon Martin, when I think of Tamir Rice being shot and killed, when I see the viral video of Eric Garner being choked to death, when I see Philando Castile being shot while his three-year-old daughter sits in the back seat of that car, I get very angry. And what I do is I channel that anger in a positive way. I use it to tell their stories because they can't tell those stories themselves any longer. So what I challenge each of you to do today is to take a journey similar to the journey that I took to get to this place of righteous anger. I'd like to invite all of you to join this exclusive family of griots by becoming your family griot, learning the stories of your family, learning the stories of your community, and utilizing those stories to take you to this wonderful place that I love being in called Righteous Anger. Thank you.